One of the unexpectedly important things that art can do for us is teach us how to suffer. It can do so by evoking scenes that are dark, melancholy or painful and that normalise and lend dignity to the feelings of suffering that we might otherwise be experiencing in isolation or confusion. They reveal, with grandeur and technical skill, that grief belongs to the human condition. Caspar David Friedrich, a painter of sublime sadness, was born in 1774 in Greifswald, an ancient trading town in the far north of Germany on the Baltic coast. It was a beautiful place in a severe northern sort of way. As a child, he loved the way the pinnacles, spires and towers of the town loomed above the trees in the haze of the very early summer mornings. His father was a modest artisan of few words and little warmth, and his beloved mother died when he was only young. When he was 13, he saw his younger brother, Johann Christopher, fall through the ice of a frozen lake and drown. He grew up shy, taciturn, and intense. He was trained as a painter from an early age, but there were many years of poverty and hardship before his distinctive style began to emerge. The taste of the era favoured sunny, classical landscapes. Summer in Italy was the ideal. But Friedrich was drawn to aspects of nature that, up to that point, people thought of as uninteresting and disagreeable. Cold, damp mornings, glacial nights by the sea, the pale hour before the sun rises, the flooded fields of late spring. Friedrich's first mature work, his first big picture where he started to present his own view of life, was a shock to his contemporaries. Instead of the conventional angels, weeping saints and soldiers, he depicted the crucifixion of Jesus as happening on top of a mountainous crag amidst Teutonic fir trees with the sun's rays striking the clouds behind. Friedrich realised then that nature could express many of the solemn moods that had previously been associated with the literal rendition of the Christian story. With time, he dispensed with direct references to Jesus altogether, but he retained the atmosphere of tragedy and grief associated with his life and death. He found that tall trees, mountains, mists, the rising of the moon, the stillness of water at night, open heathland and fog, could carry many of the same messages about pain, love, suffering and redemption as the Christian theologians once found in the Gospels. He remains a painter uniquely suited to those who no longer believe, but who remain attracted to the serious emotions that accompany belief. In 1818, when he was 43, Caspar David married 25-year-old Christiane Caroline Bommer. They had two daughters, Emma and Agnes Edelheid, and a son, Gustav Adolf, and it seems on the whole to have been a pretty good relationship. Caroline appears in many of his pictures, although usually alone, Friedrich was drawn to painting people on their own, as if what is most important about us only comes to the surface when we are away from the chatter of civilization. He himself only had a handful of friends and rarely left his simply furnished studio. Instead of solitude being something that we need to evade with business, drink or sexual fantasies, Friedrich suggests it is something that brings us into contact with our deepest possibilities. He also believed that the harshness of nature could put the sorrow of the human condition into a consoling and redeeming perspective. Humans can be cruel, fate can be remorseless, but contemplating the ineluctable collision of ice packs takes us out of ourselves, beyond the particular envy, wound or disappointment that is tormenting us, reducing our sense of personal persecution. Works like Moonrise Over the Sea make us aware of our insignificance in the vast natural world, exciting a sense of the pettiness of man's disasters in comparison with the ways of eternity, leaving us a little readier to bow to the incomprehensible tragedies that every life entails. From here, ordinary irritations and worries are neutralised. Rather than try to redress our humiliations by insisting on our wronged importance, we can, by the help of a great artwork, endeavour to apprehend and appreciate our essential nothingness. Friedrich uses this striking, jagged rock formation, a spare stretch of coast, the bright horizon, faraway clouds and a pale sky to induce us into a mood of redemptive sadness. The smaller islands of rock were once just as dramatic and thrusting as the major rock formations just beyond. The long, slow passage of time will one day wear them down as well. Above them are clouds which catch light on their undersides and pass on in their transient, pointless way, totally indifferent to all of our concerns. The picture does not refer directly to our relationships or to the stresses and tribulations of our day-to-day -day lives. Its function is to give us access to a state of mind where we are acutely conscious of the largeness of space and time and the insignificance of our situation within the greater scheme. 
the work is somber rather than sad, calm but not despairing. In that condition of mind, or to put it more romantically, state of soul, we are left, as so often with Friedrich's work, better equipped to deal with the intractable, intense and particular griefs that lie ahead of us. Like many artists, Friedrich was not terribly successful during his own lifetime. He was admired and his work purchased by a small group of serious people, and two of the most delightful painters of the era, Kirsten and Dahl, were his friends. He died in his mid-sixties in 1840, almost forgotten. He did not know that, in the distant future, his work would be deeply admired, not because it cheers us, but precisely because it knows how to reframe and express the sadness that is part of all of us. In so much 19th century painting, figures enact a narrative, a kind of story before us, and we watch them as if we're an audience looking into this space. But with the work of Caspar David Friedrich, so often he gives us a small lone figure. And instead of looking towards that figure, we in a sense become that figure, and we begin to see what the figure sees. And that's exactly what we have here in The Monk by the Sea which is in so many ways a really radically modern, pared down image. We have this vast sky and it takes up the preponderance of the canvas. It looks cold and it's clear at the top, these wisps of the clouds, but then it becomes much darker and much more menacing. The ocean below looks freezing cold, it's almost black. We can just make out large swells of the waves. And then below that, the cold winter dunes, presumably near Grievesvault in northern Germany, Germany. This is the Baltic coast, and we see that monk below the sea's horizon line. And because the figure that we're looking at is a monk, we associate that figure with questions of the spiritual. And so we immediately turn our thoughts in that direction. He is caught in those narrow bands of the earthly. He is below the horizon line, but he is aware, and we then become aware, of the vastness of the spiritual realm, of the sky above, but also the threatening nature of the world in which we inhabit. Those white caps are just picking up the tops of what are really substantial waves, and we can feel the power of nature, the power of that ocean. And I think that notion of the sublime was a very important idea at the end of the 18th and in the 19th century. This is an ancient idea that was revived survived, probably most famously by Edmund Burke in England, the idea was that there is a kind of beauty that is actually awe-inspiring through its power and its terror, and that was a way of directly confronting God's presence in our world. It's both the vastness of nature and the smallness of man and the powerlessness of man. And this figure seems to look toward the right. We know originally that Friedrich had painted a ship on the horizon, which certainly would have made this scene much more mundane. You know, the 19th century is the time most associated with man's control over nature, and this is a kind of antidote to that. This is saying, no, in fact, nature is far greater than us. Our technological advances are allowing us to feel as if we have conquered nature. Here is a humble reminder that the opposite is really true. It's right around this time that Mary Shelley is writing Frankenstein, where man has the ultimate power of creating life like God and Dr. Frankenstein is punished for the pride that makes him think he can rival God. And so I think it's really true that at this moment, at the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, we have a sense of our own power, and at the same time, we question that power. You know, in the 19th century, I think one of the key questions is how can the grandeur and power of God, of spirituality, be represented in our more scientific, more industrialized culture? So the monk by the sea is meant to be seen with a pendant, and in fact is currently hung in the museum just to the left of the abbey in the oak wood. It's a wonderful pairing of paintings because they're both deep winter, and the monk that is so contemplative in the, the monk by the sea is thought to have been the figure that is being carried in the coffin in the abbey in the oak wood. 
This is a very somber image and it really is a perfect example of the way Friedrich used landscape in order to represent issues of human life and of the divine. That's right. In this painting, we see the ruins of an abbey, an old abbey, and a procession of figures entering this ruined abbey, carrying a coffin. And so immediately we have a sense of the passage of time, of the transience of human existence. We're also looking at, it seems, the dead of winter, and perhaps at sunset. If you look at the remnant of architecture that's left, you have this, first of all, this very forlorn sense um, from the ruins themselves. But you see this old lancet window that's fallen into disrepair. No glass remains. And you have a real sense of the grandeur of the original space. But now what's left is just the futility of human experience, the futility of human effort. And what we see is that nature is eternal, but what man creates is transient. You have the monks themselves going through their ancient ritual of burial, but you see that the cemetery that surrounds them in the snow is not well tended, is haphazard, and seems to be itself falling into disrepair. The abbey refers back to the medieval tradition, but that's now fallen away. Older than that are the oak trees, which might have represented for Friedrich the Druidic traditions, the pre-Christian traditions, these truly ancient oaks, gnarled and terrifying in their silhouettes, but that speak of a tradition as witnesses that are even older than Christianity. And then beyond that, the crescent moon and the sky, when you were speaking, that's the nature that I was looking at that is permanent, that is transhistorical, that moves beyond even the growth and and death of the trees, certainly of the architecture of man's efforts. The moon having a sense of the cosmos, even beyond the seasons of the earth. That's right, and so you have this sense of human time, you have the sense of nature's time, and then you have the sense of the time of, of God's space. And in fact, if there's any optimism in this image, it is that moon. It is the faintest crescent, and it might wane even more and become a new moon, but then it will regenerate, and there is this possibility for rebirth. You mentioned that it's the dead of winter, but spring will come. And so even if it seems quite distant now, in this sort of bleak twilight, light, there is the sense that there will be renewal. So we may have a suggestion of resurrection in the cycles of the moon. We have the crosses that are part of the cemetery. We have the cross that forms part of the ruin of the abbey and that suggestion of resurrection. I think what's so interesting about Friedrich is that he's imbuing a landscape with this very, very serious meaning almost the way that in the past people had looked to the iconography of Christian paintings. Friedrich is looking for a modern language with which to express these transhistorical human feelings, contemplating our role in the universe and trying to make sense of all of those layers of time that you referred to before. That's exactly right. Friedrich is finding a new way of representing these eternal issues, and it makes sense that he would have to, because this is now the beginning of the 19th century. Friedrich is now living in a rational culture, and the idea of using the iconography of the Renaissance or even of the Baroque would feel implausible. It wouldn't make sense. And so Friedrich, this artist who was trained in Copenhagen, who grew up in Griswold, which was then part of Sweden, on the the southern coast of the Baltic, is looking towards the very extreme cold northern landscape as a way of expressing these ideas of the eternal. Mm -hmm. 